so what a fantastic audience. Uh, yeah. I've changed the title every time you ask me, so that's the last thing. It's always about the same, the same thing, anyway. I'm tr I'm, I'm, I want to contribute to the discussion about observability, uh, observables, the, the thing we, the, 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 the kind of question that Don was discussing yesterday. Um, and I'm going to do, uh, you know, do two steps. Uh, first, uh, I will present another set of possible observables. Uh, in quantum gravity, uh, which are uh, in the general family that Don was talking about generically, but not any uh, specific kind he uh, described. The characteristic is that they have to do with infinity. So they are, they are bulk observable in the sense that uh, they are not at the boundary of the whole space time, uh, but there's a boundary observable in another sense. I will say exactly what, what I mean in a, in a moment. This is pretty blah, blah, blah. You know, these things could be. But then uh, I think that the blah, blah, blah makes sense if you got, try to do something about it. So the, uh, I actually want to show you how to use these ideas to make a concrete calculation uh, in quantum gravity. So something that, in principle, theoretically, uh, might have to do with something that we measure, uh, the quantum gravitational phenomena we might measure in, uh, in our universe. Uh, the actual calculation is not completed, this is complicated. Uh, so we have a preliminary result, which is obviously wrong, in <laughs> why. Um, but that's where we are. So that's what I know. And I think what is interesting is not so much uh, the actual result of the calculation, which is going to evolve, uh, I think, as, as soon as we learn to do it better. Um, but uh, the fact that one can make, uh, the, the tentative claim that one can make um, Predictions, if you have a quantum theory of gravity, whatever is your preferred one, uh, uh, about uh, something that can be measured, and uh, 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 you can talk about these things without need at all to go out to infinity. So this is a slide uh, that at the beginning of the month, uh, uh, there was a discussion here, what are the problems? Uh, I'm not going to th go through that, but uh, all what I'm saying is related to a lot of the questions that Ted Jacobson was carefully writing down on the blackboard uh, 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 a month ago. Especially, uh, a lot of these questions have to do even, I mean, I, I don't work in ADF, CFT. I don't work in holography at all. But a lot of questions here uh, were of the sort, uh, what can you tell about the bulk physics itself? And that's what I want to discuss. And let me just start up front with a very simple observation. This is just to, to, uh, to introduce. Uh, nothing complicated, nothing quantum here. It's just classical GR. If you have a collapsing star with mass m, this is a panel diagram. So when it gets radius to m, there is, a, a, there is a, 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 an apparent horizon, some, some kind of horizon that falls, let's say at least an apparent horizon, a trapping horizon here, then it goes down. And suppose you don't look at what happens uh, after some space-like surface uh, where the curvature becomes Planckian, where quantum gravity should come in, uh, where we don't know what's really happening. But you just stay on the classical region with what, when we think that the uh, classical <coughs> or quantum uh, theory uh, uh, on a given geometry region works. Uh, well, if you just look at the volume of the black hole, meaning the volume of a space-like uh, hypersurface inside the black hole, it's large. This is a simple fact in classical GR, which haven't been, I mean, I'm sure that many of you know that, but uh, has been much stressed. In fact, it's very large. Uh, that's the expression for the volume, where uh, the volume inside this sphere here <coughs> is given by m squared times v. v is a time lapse since the collapse. So it grows linearly with the time. It's huge. It's enormous. Inside the stellar black holes that we see really in the universe around <laughs> us, uh, there is, in a precise sense, that an enormous volume, finite but enormous volume, right, which depends on how long ago they collapsed. A volume large enough that many of you like holography very much and think that there are a finite number of degrees of freedom determined by the area. If there are a finite number of the freedom determined by the area inside, then standard quantum theory is a little bit of trouble. The standard quantum theory here needs a lot of degrees of freedom I mean, forgetting 
quantum mechanics, forgetting Planck scale, just larger than Planck scale. And even if you fold in uh, um, Hawking radiation, suppose there's Hawking radiation here, so this actually shrinks. So at some later time, the radius is much smaller than 2m. Suppose you are just coming toward Planck and radius, but not that here. Then the volume is still of the order m to this power here. It's still larger um, than what would be allowed by holography um, if you just assume that there is at least one degrees of freedom per centimeter cube for a sufficiently large block. Why am I saying these things? Well, first, because I would like to get answer to that. Maybe you have answer to that. But especially because I want to do physics here. Suppose I want to do physics here. I want to know, say, if I do something here and make a measurement here, what happens? This has nothing to do with what I see in the minus phi plus, towards phi minus. Right? I want to do physics here. That's what I'm trying to do. Now, these are a couple of slides which are totally useless. I'll just say things like. Sorry, can I ask? I, I agree that the volume is big and some slicing you might write down, but. Is there any kind of invariant way? Yeah, there is. A, there is. A, yeah, yeah. That's. A, yeah, there is a technical thing behind that. Uh, is, there is an invariant way of defining the volume instead uh, inside. Uh, it is essentially the largest, uh, the largest spherical symmetric one, which is what gives you the volume uh, on, on the. The largest spherical symmetric. Yeah. So, by the way, so there's a related question, and that is, you know, if you have a large volume, might, you might think there are a large number of possible quantum states. But you know, can I excite all of these <coughs> quantum states? And there, there are yeah. additional restrictions. I, I'm sure. Of course, I'm just posing this as a, as a, and I'm sort of suggesting. Look, in this large volume, it's true that I don't have much time if I'm here, right? Of mm -hmm. course, just, just gonna very, very fast. Uh, fall into the quantum region, and that's mm -hmm. be later. But for a while, I can make measurements here. And why should just standard field theory go wrong there? Maybe it does, or maybe it doesn't. I don't just want to put this. Uh, Carlo, are you pretending that you solved the no. problem of collapse in the interior? No. I haven't pretend. Is it short? What is it? Oh, this? This I is mean, a. How do you compute this volume if you don't know the magnitude? Oh, I do it with a with, instead of a, 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 a. Sorry, this is a this is a collapsing star, so outside is charge. But you're assuming spherical symmetry. Charge, spherical symmetry. Oh, assuming spherical symmetry and uh, charge. Yeah, that's the calculation of charge. You 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 ask what is the largest space like surface with given spherical so symmetry. There is an issue because it, there's this sort of instabilities, right? PKL, PKL. Yeah, yeah. You might so you, you might, might think, think this is not the right solution. Uh, Nothing this settles down inside. This is, this is yeah, yeah, so yeah. So close sure. to the singularity that, that you have to really worry about that too much, I think. Absolutely, but I'm, look, I'm, I'm much before any large curvature region. So, <laughs> but this was just a you know, look, there is a big space there. And, so I think there is sort of agreement here that in some sense quantum gravity is not a local quantum field theory in the sense of HAG, in the sense of uh, operator associated to arbitrary small space time region, for two reasons. One is just uh, one which I think you all know very well. The, I mean, the observables in a space time coordinate points are not gauge invariant. And also another region, reason which have to do, I mean, I come from loop quantum gravity, from the discreteness of space time. If you come from string theory, I put Gabriele here because I was thinking of the old uh, you know, Veneziano, Amati, Cefaloni arguments that you cannot test arbitrary small uh, uh, regions uh, in string theory, uh, <coughs> naively because you excite <coughs> the freedom of the string if you put a lot of uh, uh, energy. So then there are two things to do. Either you go to, to uh, either you go to, um, Asymptotic, so you try to face the problem. And I want to suggest a way to say it's, uh, face the problem directly, and that I'm coming closer to what I want to say. Uh, and let me introduce it this way. In, in quantum mechanics, the way I like to think about quantum mechanics, uh, each of us has a different way of thinking about quantum mechanics. Uh, but even Jim, in his last uh, paper, talks about the observables, the, observa the observer in quantum mechanics. The way I want to think about quantum mechanics is I'm interacting with the system or some external physics interact with the system, and the theory tells me what happens in the interaction. That is local in the sense that it's on the boundary between the system. And in generativity, there is a, also a notion of locality, which is that you know, generativity is about regions of space-time and how they interact with one another. Let me just combine the two and identify a quantum system with a space-time region finite. 
So I'm going to consider finite space-time regions with a boundary, and I, this is the kind of things which I want to discuss. So, um, so that's a fairly semi-classical notion, right? How, how do you define that when, say, the geometry is strongly fluctuating? I'm <laughs> going to get that will be all the, all, the following, all the following things. So at the end of the day, just to, to anticipate, the idea is that there will be quantum states around and uh, uh, transition arm, uh, associated to, to the boundary and transition arm to associated to the uh, 4D regions. And Bianca, after me, will have a similar uh, <coughs> setting to a lot of what she's doing. Now, let me start classically, just to clarify things classically. The key object here is the Hamilton function. Um, Hamilton function, uh, assume you all know what it is, and the next slide is just a, a definition. Um, it was introduced by Hamilton in a fantastic paper in which there is this marvelous sentence. Uh, uh, he says, uh, uh, the function of Mr. Lagrange defines the problem. The function of Mr. Hamilton solves the problem. <laughs> So what's Hamilton? Uh, Feynman was in love with Hamilton function, of course. If you look at the beginning of Hamilton Eves, it's all about that. So what's a Hamilton function? You have a, you, uh, take a finite dimensional system uh, from T and T prime. It starts at Q, it ends at Q prime. Let's here, for the sake of the discussion here, imagine there's a single solution that goes from Q to Q prime in this time. Call the solution in this funny matter, compute the action, and uh, the Hamilton function is the value of the action um, as a function of T, Q, T prime, Q prime. There's a function or the boundary variables t, t prime, q, q prime um, of, the, of the system. And if you had it, it has a lot of beautiful properties. The solution of Hamilton Jacobi equation, special solution of Hamilton Jacobi equation. If you take the derivative with respect to q, you get p. If you take the derivative with respect to t, you get the energy, <coughs> all that stuff. And it has, an, uh, it, is a, it has a brother, of course, in quantum mechanics, which we know very well. And it's a brother of it because uh, it's a propagator, is this object here, because uh, uh, the exponential of the propagator to the first order in uh, one of the h bar is, uh, is just related to the Hamilton function like that. And of course, it's the object you can write as a path integral if you have a definition mm -hmm. of that. Now, first observation. Look what happens. If you want to do general activity, the difficulty of general activity is that there are no local observables. So there is different variants, right? A, in terms of t, there is an invariant. There is a reprimatization in t under which the action is invariant. So let me rewrite a system here, this is a harmonic oscillator, in the manner in which generativity is, re is written. So instead of having Q as a function of T, I have a Q and T as a function of a parameter with, a Lagrange, with an action defined by this Lagrangian, which is invariant under reprimatization. And let me write the Hamilton function. And then magic, magic, the Hamilton function is not a function of T and T, tau, of tau and tau prime. So it's not a function of the initial and final value of the parameter is just independent of that, which is a simple two-line derivation. So the Hamilton function of this formulation and of this formulation are the same. Now, what I'm saying, I'm trying to drive home this uh, lecture. I'm going to use this. If we don't know how to do general relativistic physics, instead of trying to translate our system as much as possible into non-relativistic, into non-general relativistic language, Let's take the general relativistic formulations that works for all system and use that for. And the prototypical example um, of the general relativistic, the, 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 the quantity of standard classical mechanics that survives in general relativistic case is the Hamilton function and the propagator. Because if I do the quantum theory of that, for, do, for this I do the path integral in Q of tau and T of tau, it turns out again that this independent of tau and tau prime, in fact, is same object as, as before. Now, of course, there's no evolution in T. It's just the sort of formally the projector on the wheel of the wheat equation of the uh, quantization of the system. This is, this is a Hamiltonian constraint and so on and so forth. Now I want to use this. This is all fine and uncontroversial and simple in finite dimension. Now I think a field theory. In a field theory, there is an object. Uh, which is more or less defined, depending on what you mean by being bad defined. But for instance, it's used in lattice gauge theory a lot uh, by some uh, people, which is the boundary function. Again, so you fix the boundary variables, and then you integrate in the bulk, but the bulk is not in field. And, uh, and, and you get a function of the values of the field on the boundary. And this can be computed uh, in two dimensions. It can be computed explicitly. It can be computed for finite. For, for free theories, for instance, for a large 
for, for some shapes of sigma. Sigma is too complicated, you don't see. Are you, are you integrating on fields both inside and outside? No, only inside. Only, only inside uh, with, a, with a fixed boundary. But is the theory a theory that? Yes, the theory is a okay. theory that is outside. So the other fields are just kind of sitting there? If you, I think I, I took away a nice equation which would have. Um, suppose you want the, the two point function. So you, you're integrating all these fields, outside and inside, and on the boundary. Yeah. Now let me break this integration in the integration of the outside field, the integration of the inside field, and the boundary integration. And then I can write the two point function as just a simple integration on the boundary of the result of the integration outside, which I call the boundary state, and the result of the integration oh, of the inside. Good, which is good, good, good. Okay. So you are integrating over all of those. Oh, yeah, yeah. Sure, sure. I'm not so changing the theory. The state on the That's right. Sure. Although at this point, you've broken diff invariance by selecting. I'm going to get to this. Keep okay. it. That's the question. Okay. <laughs> does, does sigma have a definite signature? Or Sorry? Does sigma have a definite signature? Is it space-like, time-like, mix? <clears throat> Uh, no, no. Uh, here I'm thinking that this is uh, uh, later on. I will restrict to, s to cases in which it's all space-like. It's sort of like that. But for the moment, no. You can take this uh, for the lattice gauge theory. They well, they do Euclidean. But if they did, now the key point. Uh, of course, imagine you could do that. I imagine you had a quantum theory of a different most invariant theory. You could do that, and then of course this thing here would be independent on sigma. For the same reason as the Hamilton function and the propagator is independent of tau type prime in the previous thing. What does this mean? I mean, how, how does sigma disappear? Then? Well, that's a physicist version of that. If you make a measure, suppose you have a your particle coming in, some scatter region particle coming out. What do you need? You need some detector that measures the particle, the field, but then you need uh, where, where this thing is to know the, the momentum, the position, and the time. But the moment, the position and time are just function of the gravitational field. So if you know phi, the gravitational field, on the boundary, you don't need extra information to say where the boundary is. That's what diffeomorphism variance is all about. The relative position of things is not in terms of the coordinates, but is in terms of the gravitational field, which tell me what is the distance between the, uh, the, this, this thing. So in general relativistic uh, theory, distance and time measurement, of course, field measurement, and uh, uh, the reference to Jim here is that, uh, in a sense, what I'm doing here is a, is a subclass of the kind of observable that Jim considers when he does uh, in some of the histories so with some subclass of histories. I'm saying that consider all the histories which have a given value on the boundary, and uh, in a general relativistic theory, in a, sorry, in a gravitational theory, this is sufficient for giving me all the possible relevant information about the boundary. I don't need the boundary geometry in addition because it's written in the boundary state. But, but, but phi is the boundary field, the boundary data yeah. is on some space, a, 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 you know, one lower dimensional space. Three dimensional that's space. I'm, I'm, uh, yeah, let's talk you think about that's it. an abstract yeah. sphere, say, yeah. independent of how it's embedded in the space time. There's no space time. That's all there is. I mean, there's some geometry. You want to know. The value of the function of a large sphere or small sphere, just put a value of the gravitational field, which makes it large or small. Okay. Now, as Tom um, uh, was saying before, uh, we don't need, let's think about the propagator again. We don't need to just consider a propagator with Q and Q prime, maybe eigenstates, states which are eigenstate of the position. In principle, we can put P e and P prime, or any state, psi and psi prime. So we might be interested in things like that, which in our optimization invariant theory are, uh, if you want, formally, very formally, uh, petition, uh, matrix element of the project on the solution of the Wheeler equation uh, between two arbitrary states. Um, in a field theory, and in particular in general relativity, I don't care very much who is the past states and who is the future state. In fact, I want a formalism that ignores that. So for the moment, let me just simply take the uh, uh, sort of the, 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 the past Hilbert space and the future Hilbert space with the tensor product mm -hmm. and view this as a bra on a cat, which lives in the boundary Hilbert space 
being the tensor product of the initial finite in the spaces. But do you need some kind of time reversal to kind of broaden your? Yeah, exactly. I'm sorry. Do you need what your? <coughs> it looks like you have different. I, I need a star. If you want. I need a star. You need a star. Yeah, I need a star. I'm missing stuff. So you introduce one via some time reversal symmetry or some such thing. How do you define the star? I need uh, the situation I'm going to find myself is not that I have h in <coughs> h out. I have to go the back. I have to get the boundary space, but I have the boundary space, and I have to ask myself if and how I can divide into the tensor product of two. And at that point, that this question becomes relevant. But the, the left-hand side of that equation was complex, and it depended which was on which side. Yeah, yeah, there is a star yeah, here. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Similar sorry. I mean, so there's a star. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a type. It's in spin forms, it's sometimes real. It's sometimes? It's real. It's the amplitude. It's, yeah. Well, well yeah. Mm. But it's just I don't exactly the, uh, the orientation. So this is just an advertisement of our two books. The last one I wrote with Francesca, in which all this is done in, 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 in detail. So this is a short summary. But let's make this concrete, uh, because otherwise it's just blah, blah, blah. So I'm, I'm going to make it concrete in two short steps. One is I'll just flash the equations of loop quantum gravity, because that's the theory I'm going to use. So just a couple of transparencies about loop quantum gravity. I don't want to convince you that you should start working in loop quantum gravity. I will certainly fail. Uh, but uh, uh, that's the theory I'm going to use. Then uh, what is interesting here is how to use that theory for doing calculation and for. So that's loop quantum gravity in its covariant version in one single transparency. So all you want to know about loop quantum gravity is here. So how is it defined? Well, there is a, there is a, um, it's defined two steps, the kinematics and the dynamics, so to say. The kinematics is the boundary. It's a Hilbert space. It's a Hilbert space. A Hilbert space is defined like Fox space, so to step, step by step. So there's no particle, one particle, Hilbert space, two particle. The Hilbert space of all states up to n particle, then you, there's a suitable n going to infinity limit. So here is similar. The Hilbert space is nothing particularly strange. It's the same kind of things that come out of lattice gate theory. The algebra of observables, and that relates sort of to what Steve has been doing. The algebra observable is not in any sense a local algebra observable um, because uh, the operator uh, lo localized the dependent L, and L is, uh, uh, on, is uh, it's, uh, uh, the operator sits on the state itself. The where of the operators is given by the state themselves. It's like in, 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 in field theory, you can have a, 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 an n-particle state, uh, say that particle has certain position, and moment, a certain momentum, and now you want to ask what is the momentum of that particle. That's a well-defined question. You can pose it. But it's not something that you can easily write in terms of uh, uh, fields, uh, local observables. Right, because it's the, the where is where the particle is. So it's uh, something something like that is going on here. In other words, if you want, this is like a, a, a lattice gate theory in a lattice, but the lattice is not a fixed lattice. The lattice is uh, is the is given by the excitation of space time itself. So the quantum particle, the particles here are the space time positions themselves, which are this uh, discrete. I'll say. <coughs> This is very vague, but I just want to, I, I'm not doing a, a summary of loop quantum gravity here. And then there's transition amplitude. Transition amplitude are, 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 are given by, so given a state here, I can compute transition amplitude, and are given by some SU2, SL2C uh, uh, integrals. Uh, there is some uh, uh, SL2C unitary representation theory here. These are the matrix element in the canonical basis of SL2C unitary representation of the infinite dimensional ones. And you get some number. Now, uh, what what do you do with that? First of all, uh, you look for the classical limit, and uh, so the theory is, defi is defined uh, by order by order in some truncation, which you include more and more degrees of freedom. At each order, there are some theorems that tells you that uh, uh, the h bar going to zero limit connects to a truncation of general relativity, and more precisely to a regge truncation of general relativity. So how? Well, again, in the same sense in which the propagator connects to the Hamilton function. 
and generativity in principle, we have, nobody knows how to compute it, but you have a well-defined Hamilton function of generativity. If you give me the three geometry on a closed boundary, say boundary like that, and you knew how to write the Hamilton function, you would have solved the Einstein equations. Now, in, on, on a regge, in a regge theory, uh, at least this is uh, more uh, <coughs> defined, and uh, uh, regge on a given uh, triangulation is the h going to zero limit of this transition amplitude here. Then, of course, you have to take this continuous limit here, uh, and uh, the, the theory is in principle defined, uh, defined here. So in this sense, there is a, we know something about the classical limit, the space-time discrete and the old one of quantum gravity, of loop quantum gravity, and the main sort of result is that this transition up to a gave you the finite to all orders. The ultraviolet finite and infrared finite to all orders in the uh, in, uh, I think I'll skip this, on the, because this is going to come out. So the yeah, so 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 name up there. Uh -huh. Is it fair to say that while they are finite, um, there's no sense in which it's understood that the theory is unitary? So normally in quantum field theory, we want to establish, you know, one of the properties we go for is unitary. So I just wanted to point out, is it, it um, it's not something that's been really addressed at this level, or, or what's the status of that? Uh, this is going to open a long, long discussion, which I prefer to postpone it. So I, I, I won't make any claim about unitarity at this point. At, at all, so. so maybe, well, another question that may lead to long discussion. This, of course, could, could open up, right, right, you can discuss yes. what about loop quantum gravity, but that's not right. what I want to talk about here. I just well, wanted to say I think say it's so. good to have more of that discussion, but obviously we've got limited yeah. time now. But uh, another question is, uh, so with regard to the assertion that we have, say, IR finiteness, is one understand well enough how one matches on to the, say, usual approximate field theory picture that one can see how this is resolving the usual IR the problems? U, the UV, yes. The IR, oh, IR no. Okay. The IR, no. And the IR finite is, in fact, is not in that in the version I gave you, because I'm cheating, but in the version with cosmological constant. And what happens here Positive is that cosmological cos the cosmological constant works effectively for an, an effect, effective IR regulator. Can okay. Which side? Yeah, which side? Positive. 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 Absolutely. It only exists with a positive cosmological constant. The sitter-like, you're saying? Huh? The sitter-like. The sitter. Yeah. The sitter. Yeah. Okay. The sitter. Yes. You're talking about the well, I mean, it's a, yeah. It's a, it's a, it bounds the distance to which you. Mm -hmm. And, and the, the way it comes out is a limitation of this sum here. It just uh, well, runs there, out to some, up to some value. Right. There, as we've been discussing, there are possibly even more severe IR problems. So it, it would be good to maybe. Chat more about that later. I'm not sure. I'm not sure they're the far. same IR problems. Uh, they might. I don't know. So it's kind of I, a soft graviton problem that becomes even more pronounced. So physically, this is uh, in the sum of the geometries. Uh, even if you have a finite boundary, you can have arbitrary large geometries inside that contribute. But, no, but I, as you go to the future. Uh, but anyway, I, again, I don't want to derail your talk too much. So. Oh, can I just <clears> ask <throat> one question about the formalism? Usually. Made this analogy to lattice gauge theory. There's a, there's a large uh, degree of choice as to what the amplitudes are because you can choose different lattice Hamiltonians or lattice actions. I don't see any of that here. Are you claiming there's none? It's canonically no. fixed to be no, no. these. There's no claim whatsoever of that sort here. In fact, uh, is, let me put it this way. It's not easy to play around and change without losing Lorentz invariance, without losing this, without Lorentz invariance. But there's no claim about uniqueness in any sense. And uh, the way at least some part of the community this side have been working is that is there a definition of amplitudes such that, okay. you so know. So you're saying this is one ansatz that satisfies. That satisfies property. Right. There's no, no, no. no. Uh, I'll skip that unless it comes out. Maybe I'll just say a word. Carlo, I mean, in your classical limit, you, you, you say you get the Reggie action. You get a manifold automatically? No. Is, is the spin network defined on a no. manifold? Or is it just some general uh, A manifold in this, you, you give a piecewise, something like a piecewise flat manifold, if you want. If you want to associate an interpretation 
geometrical interpretation to regi, you can say, well, there are, there are simplices, flat simplices attached to one another with curvature on them. Yeah, I would regard that as a piecewise linear manifold. Right? Yeah. It's usually right? You can, you can interpret this way. Here is similar with some technical differences are called twisted geometries, but this is similar idea. Thanks. Oh, yeah, here I, I was kept hesitating. I think I, I, I do have a little bit of time. Um, there is a huge difference with uh, lattice gauge theory, which I want to point out because uh, um, I call it dict invariant because the, and I got the core of this from some work by Bianca. If you discretize a standard system, this is a harmonic oscillator. You discretize it, you write the path integral. As you all know, you have to take two limits, the number of steps going to infinity and the lattice spacing going to zero in order to recover the propagator, the, 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 the thing which is we know for the continuous theory. Now you can trade the lattice spacing going to zero to, uh, to some, uh, uh, you, you can change variables from small q, small q to large q uh, to a moving a constant here omega to its critical value. If you do that, <coughs> Take the same things, uh, write it in a representation variant way, do the same thing, and look how magic happens. This happens all the time. A square A, 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 A disappears. So in the path interval of that, uh, you, you, you take a certain number of steps. You, if you want to find this, the, the, the propagator, you just have to take the number of steps to infinity and not a critical a value, to, a, a constant to a critical value. Mm -hmm. This happens in all the decent uh, discretization of uh, these invariant systems, and uh, it's a core reasons for which ultraviolet is different in the, from standard field theory. Standard Sorry. field theory, ultraviolet means going small with in X and T. But here X and T are gauges, so they, there's nothing but to do. Isn't, isn't, isn't the gauge, I mean, this statement is just the gauge statement. I mean, it's just a the theory is a parameterization variant. You can just scale time, and that's uh, yeah. yeah. So just that. It, just it that. Then it has a constant gauge invariance and has no physical. Uh, it is. It is exactly. Okay. Sorry. It is exactly that. Okay. Uh, the, the result is that this equation is true, where there is no constant to be taken to a critical value. This is a fact. Okay. So let me go now <coughs> to the second part. I'll, I'll, I'll be fast. I want to use all this um, and present you a calculation of what happens in the quantum region, okay? And uh, I want to start with uh, giving you a, a piece of a, a technical result in classical GR, which was uh, enormously surprising to me when it came out. Uh, if I tell you, you don't believe it, but it's true, and uh, I'll show you why. So the, the statement is the following. There is a metric, which is written here, but I'm illustrating it. Um, this is its... Uh, Penrose diagram, uh, which is an exact solution of the Einstein equations everywhere except in this gray region here. Um, so let me illustrate it here. So uh, it's Minkowski here. Then you have a, a shell that comes in. I, we took a null shell because it's easier to do a calculation. So it's a, a Schwarzschild here. The shell enters its, uh, the shell has a certain mass. It enters its, uh, uh, its horizon, its uh, 2n. So this is a, a, a trapping horizon, and, and so far so good. But the point is that there is an exact solution of Einstein equation, which you can continue here, which here is still in cost, is still uh, Schwarzschild. Here is a white hole. Here is an outgoing shell, and this is Minkowski again. Now, if you have either you knew that already, or if you have studied enough relativity, you say no, this is impossible. Why you say this is impossible? Because we all know that you can put the outside of a black hole and a white hole together, but the black hole is after and the white hole is before. And I'm saying you that is the other way around. So what is the trick? The trick is that the metric here is indeed isometric to this, but locally and not globally. So it's not a one-to-one. -one. And in fact, the map is the following. If you take this part here of uh, uh, Schwarzschild, you can isometrically map it into this one. And if you take this one, you can isometrically map into this one. So it's like when you take a piece of paper, you know, you take a, a cone with um, not a positive but negative curvature, you cut it, you open up, it's in fact isometric to 
a flat space, but there is an overlap. So it's not one to one. It's, 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 uh, okay. So you can construct, there's nothing wrong, construct a matrix with this. You just have to go through this trick, which I call the finger. You, know, you just cut this, cut this, open up, and stick a piece of something inside we don't know, which is where quantum theory is supposed to happen. So Sorry. what does this mean? <coughs> it means. What, was it a solution to vacuum Einstein equations, you said? It is an exact solution of vacuum Einstein equation in all this white region, white region, white region. Uh, the here is no vacuum because there is a, an incoming shell. So your shell violates some energy conditions when you, your shell eventually violates some energy conditions when you time reverse it. Yeah. The shell violates the energy condition only when it enters in the in the quantum region. In the quantum region, of course, uh, 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 mm -hmm. you can invent something new, but it violates the energy. And, and also but outside, the shell doesn't violate any. So, your quantum region has some. I assume you have a modified. So that gray region is not a very nice time equation, right? That's the gray region. Uh, I, I wrote a metric, but it's not a solution for Einstein equation. In fact, the metric I wrote is pretty much. And, and also, you insist that there is some causality in this diagram. Some. There is some sense of causality in the diagram still. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So. It's weird that some tip of that gray region, if you look into the past, you actually don't see any high energy quantities, and you still need to violate. Uh, the tip of this goes out to 12. No? Yeah, so that tip, that's in the region where you need to modify Einstein equation. But I'm from coming that to that. Yeah, yeah, I'm coming to that. That's in two slides. So you, you, you're asking me, uh, is the gray region leaking out the region where we expect quantum effects to be? I'm going to yeah. address this in, the, but, in a moment. But differently, you could have you know, some stress tensor there. and maybe. Are you going to say more about the kind of stress tensor you would need to uh, uh, geometry like that? Uh, not as much as I would like be able to, but <laughs> um, kind of. in fact, I mean, when you say it's a solution of the Einstein equation, you take that metric and you compute the union. Right. No, I take I take Gimunu this metric. Yeah, you compute yeah. Gimunu. Gimunu. Yeah. Exactly. I take no 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 no. Wait, you let's not. Data. I take this metric. I compute the union. I get zero here. I get zero here. I get zero all over. I get exactly here the, the, the stress energy tensor of an incoming fall and also the one here. Okay. Here I get something which has no physical, <laughs> decent physical interpretation and which violates the energy condition. Okay. So it's not trivial at all that there is a so let me put it physically. General relativity, classical general relativity is compatible with a star collapsing, entering its own black hole. Something happening, which you might, but something happening in a compact region, in a, in a small region of space time, larger, slightly larger than 2m. And then from that, say, quantum region, a, the shell bouncing out and coming out, it's past horizon. It's white hole horizon. You're violating the energy condition outside the horizon. Yes, in the, 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 the gray region goes out, uh, is, leaks outside the horizon. Uh, by a tiny bit, but it needs to, otherwise this would be impossible. Otherwise, you know, you, you go up to the standard one. So, and Just to is check, it, the sorry. dotted line really is you know, R equals 2M for this. Solution. The dot is R to M or the trapping horizon. If, if there's some Hawk radiation, which I'm not considering at all here, yes. Okay. That's, that's the R to Quick question. Uh, over here. Is, there, is it flat space uh, yeah. up in the top corner? Yeah, it's flat space here. <laughs> well, it's tied it's it's of... Well, this pulse has positive energy? Yeah, yeah. The one, sure, the one sure, going sure. Yeah, yeah, sure. That's, yeah. Okay. Positive no, no. It's like a ball. Is that a ball that bounces up? Okay. It's just uh, the standard. If you want, it's, this is T symmetric, right? Okay, yeah, that's fine. It's uh, T minus T symmetric, which doesn't mean that the energy. Okay. Uh, What's nice about that, now you have the metric, if you don't look at the quantum thing, you can compute the proper time here and the proper time here. This is Minkowski. You have a preferred uh, frame in Minkowski because it's where the frame where this happens. So the time from here to here is proportional to the mass. The time from here to here, <laughs> uh, sorry, yeah, the time, the time from here to here, the, the time along a constant radius here is given by that formula. It's an easy calculation in charge of geometry. Where 2r is in Minkowski the time it takes to go in and go out. So uh, uh, that's 2r. Plus a term, delta is small, 
So this is negative. So plus the term, which is very, very large, because delta is very, very small. Delta has to do with how we really can from here. Um, so this can be very, very large. So if the uh, take a star, m of the order of a star, then the time inside for this process is a millisecond. The time outside for this process is a billion years. It's a lot of billion years. So suppose for a moment, I don't want you to believe that, but suppose for a moment that this would describe a black hole. And what is a black hole? A black hole is a star that collapses, bounces out, goes through some quantum things, bounces out in a very, very short time. The time roughly, the light time of its radius, its diameter. But since there is this huge time delay due to the fact that there is a big uh, gravitational potential here, from the outside, this is a very slow process. From the outside, like always in general relativity, you see it's a slow motion. So here's a picture of a black hole. A black hole is a star that collapses and bounces out, seeing an extremely slow motion because of a huge time dilation. Well, I have to get to quantum gravity. So, I'm, um, so now we want to know how much is this time? So evaluate delta. How, how much is this uh, bounce time? How much this is longer than that? And uh, we have a, a number of most, a number of ways of trying to guess it. First guess, this is what Don Marov came out as soon as I told him that. Oh, of course, it's exponential in the mass. Why? Well, because this is a tunneling. You have a classical you know, a metric, a history, which is not a solution of the equation of motion. It's a solution at some point, some other point. So it violates. So this, of course, can happen in quantum. If this is an effective description of a tunneling phenomenon. A tunneling phenomenon is a non analytic h bar is e to the action over h bar. h bar is h bar g, so the Planck mass. So you want a mass, a mass up step up square. So in fact, I need an m square. So it's going to be huge, right? Um, I think that this first guess is wrong. Um, I don't want to argue with that too much. Uh, because this is not really a tunneling. A tunneling is a tunneling in space, it's a tunneling in time, and the time structure is completely different here. There's time infinity, a time there. Uh, but that's one possibility. Of course, if this was the case, it doesn't mean that it would really be so long because the hole would shrink because of Hawking radiation before that. So it would become small, so this would become small. So this phenomenon could still happen, but roughly at m cubed when the black hole is known. Second hypothesis. Uh, let me read the, the firewall paper and say, well, I don't believe in firewalls, so some hypothesis must be wrong in the, uh, of, of the theorem. The theorem is right. Um, so something should be violated with respect to the hypothesis at least a page time, so order m cube. So suppose that this is what happens. Then this should happen in the time m cube. Carl, question? Coming back to the first test, I mean, if you actually just did this calculation within general relativity, there's no large curvature, so you might, you might think that would be the correct way to do the calculation. And then wouldn't you get the first answer because you're getting basically getting something involving the size of the black hole over the plot length? I tried to do this calculation, I, I failed. I couldn't. Because uh, you mean using the standard like, way of computer tunneling? Or well, actually, I mean, there, I, would, I, would, I would mean by... The Euclidean action? No, actually, I, I would look in the wheel of the equation. You know, look, 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 at, look, at, look at actual WKB solutions to the wheel of the equation. Ah, well, that's... Uh, yeah, 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 that's, that's, that's so view it as... Uh, yeah. I, I failed, because uh, I can try... I could show you what I did, and I couldn't do it. Now, this is my favorite uh, answer. This, this comes to the question that some, some of you uh, asked before. This, this equation, this matrix violates the classic Einstein equation also in a region where you wouldn't expect it naively because the curvature is small, okay? Which is a tip region here, okay? Now that's true, but if you have a small, okay, so here the curvature is small, so quantum gravitation effects are small, but they're not zero because curvature is not zero. And there's a long parameter which is time. If you stay at a constant time, go close here. Uh, along here, you stay at constant time. Uh, sorry, you stay at constant radius uh, uh, at a certain value of the curvature <coughs> for a very, very long time. So the correct parameter, I would say, or I would 
try to guess. It's not curvature, but the curvature of type time. So you you have quantum gravity effects either because the curvature is large, or for a large, a small curvature, the effects are small, but they can pile up in a long time. So if you use this as a condition to tell you when you you expect the, 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 this possible sort of violation of the classicality here. So this tells you how, how this can go out from, from to when. What you get is, is a, whoops, what you get is a time, uh, time m square. Now, all this is blah, blah, blah. Can we make a calculation? And I'm not I mean, sorry, you sorry, can sorry, make sorry. a calculation. No, yeah. Maybe you're going to say, I mean, is there some sense in which the curvature is all localized at that one orbifold no. point? No. No, 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 no. The curvature grows as one over our, what is called, cube? Uh, oh, so it's, you can't as it should with the radius. No, no, no. Okay. So can we make a calculation? And that was the, the bottom line of all the story. Yes, let's make a calculation. <laughs> I want a transition from this surface here, uh, sort of before the quantum region, uh, which is, uh, is the surface here in the, in the Tushkin extension, to the surface here. Now here nothing happens. It's just the transition from here to here. So I have a bounded finite region of space-time. I know the metric in the past. I know the metric in the future. I want to know what is the probability amplitude to go from one to the other. And uh, it's not too hard because I can, you know, at the surface, I know it's intrinsic geometry. I know it's extrinsic geometry. Same here. In fact, it's the same intrinsic geometry because it's T-symmetric. And the extrinsic geometry is the same with the minus sign because of T-invariants. Mm -hmm. um, so let me use now the equation of loop quantum gravity to write a state uh, which is a, a semi-classical state, a coherent state, that represents uh, the geometry intrinsic, extrinsic here, one here, Fold it in my equations, put it there, go to the brut most brutal truncation that I can do. Um, and uh, this is, um, I get some complicated integral of SL to CSU2. This is going to depend on two quantities one which knows about the intrinsic geometry, one which knows about the extrinsic geometry. The intrinsic geometry essentially knows about the, the size, the, the, the spin is the area, is, which is a mass, the black hole. The extrinsic geometry is the other quantity, which if you look carefully on the geometry of that, is exactly what depends on the, on the delta on the delta here. So this, you, you can compute this amplitude, and we did compute this amplitude, and then you can say when this amplitude, when, when the model square of this amplitude of order one, is when this is possible. So if you write this, let me just finish, you get a relation between j and k, which is a relation between the mass and the time, and we did it, and we get t m log m. <coughs> It's wrong, but... Well, so yeah. are you saying you're filling in the region between the yellow and green, you know, the, the missing piece, yeah. uh, with not with some exotic stress tensor, but uh, <coughs> you're sort of doing a loop quantum yeah. gravity? Yeah, no. Okay, so, exactly. so no exotic matter. Exactly. Now, I forget completely the, the, the metric that I wrote there before. Mm -hmm. It was just a tentative way of filling this. And just figure out how... I forget, yeah. And I just say, from here to here, it's a quantum calculation, I have this state, this state, what's the amplitude of going from this to that? The amplitude is going to depend on the parameters, and it's going to be large if some parameters satisfy some relation, and this gives me a mass time. So is the space um, being described by a spin network state that's got yeah. many, many vertices, or is it just... No, no, no. This is a brutal truncation in which you have a, simplest, a very simple spin network. That's why it's probably wrong. Just because we're doing it, I mean, what's the, what's the nature of that spin network? Is it one simplex? Yeah, or? yeah, yeah. It's a su super simple triangulation. Basically, what's going from here to here is you have, you have a geometry with an intrinsic and extrinsic uh, geometry, right. and you flip the extrinsic okay. And is the state, you said it's a coherent state, so yeah. it's got a spread of both uh, metric yeah. and extrinsic. Curve. Yeah, so you can play on which, but whatever you do, you always get you got in this. So but there's an extra parameter that doesn't matter. So this is like an exotic sort of star. You know, it, it's similar, I, I think, as we've discussed to this old massive remnant scenario that I proposed <coughs> long ago. But I guess you're saying that, you know, when you come into this exotic star, the exotic stuff you find is, you know, some spin network uh, 
that doesn't look anything like classical space. It's a superposition of geometries. Of, uh, yeah, and, yeah, exactly. Yeah, okay. So the, the star exactly comes in, it gets to a, to, to, to a quantum region. We call it Planck star when it's when the quantum region. Well, I'm, I'm even suggesting, well, it, the region that's outside the horizon, you know, you might think of as like a stellar surface, you know. Yeah. Analogous to a neutron you, star being sure. outside the horizon, and you come in, you hit quantum geometry. Yes. Basically, that's, that's right. what you're saying. That's right. yeah. Of course, there is a region. It, it's the, the quantum part doesn't start to write at the horizon. Well, well inside. Well, it's probably quantum where the gap is between yellow and green outside the horizon. Isn't that quantum too? Uh, yeah. I mean, sure. Uh, uh, there's no horizon here. Uh, where is the horizon? <coughs> yeah, so here it's already quantum outside the horizon. Yeah, and that little wedge outside. Yeah, the, yeah. Okay. So yeah. after, so your, if, you, if, you sit near, if you sit near the, the black hole, for a long time everything is classical, but after a long, this is a very long time. This is an M squared or M cubed. At some point something happens. That's the hypothesis. But for someone falling into the black hole, it can be instantly quantum. For someone calling, falling into the black hole, it still has a, a, a long time, well, long depending on the mass, or so the n, uh, to, to, to which everything is completely classical, as you expect. At some point, you get to the, not a Planckian region, radius, but to the, to the region where the curvature becomes Planckian. Here is when the uh, density becomes Planckian, just a large. Yeah, but, but your argument is that uh, you want the time, you want Weak curvature, but if you don't wait long enough time, that is inverse curvature, you expect to see something interesting. I didn't get it, sorry. So you have a criteria saying that the curvature times time should be L Planck inverse to to make something interesting happen? I am saying, is yeah, it's two different things. Uh, that's right. I'm saying that uh, if, you, if you take that criterion here, you don't need to do calculation. You just dimensionally, you just look where things happen and you get T of the order of things. Yeah, yeah, but I'm saying that time is only applicable to someone who sits near the black hole. Oh, yeah, yeah. Sure, sure, sure. The time here is always a local time. There's no global time. If someone, some observer just happened to start from far away and swim by, things go wrong for him very fast. And he doesn't see that coming from the curvature, local curvature. That's a good point also, yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. I take this point as a, even as a criticism in a sense, yeah. So, so I, I guess I want to come back to Joe's point. I mean, I think there is a curvature singularity at the tip of your wedge. You have a surplus angle. You've, already, you've patched things together. I mean, I do call it an orbital. But I mean, yeah, you, you have more than 360 degrees around before you've added anything inside. So that's going to give you a delta function in the curvature at the tip. So you don't see it. The curvature doesn't blow up. It's, it's, and maybe you're saying you know, one of our behavior as you approach it. But there is, I think, what you call delta is a singular point outside the horizon which is the boundary of your quantum region. Doesn't this depend on the details of the... I'm, 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 I'm happy to... I, I think the way you've constructed it, you're guaranteed that you're going to get a surplus angle there. Does well, this line here and this line here converge? Well, that's, you're moving two pieces of <coughs> sports show that overlap. But he might be arguing that he's regularizing that with some quantum geometry or whatever. No, but the quantum geometry is supposed to only inside that region, not... Not, well, does it include the point no, delta? No, no, no. I, I need, yeah, it's, I'm, I, I, I don't think it needs to. I cut a few corners here, of course. They, you, can, you can just cut a corner and everything yeah. will be fine. Yeah, I, I, uh, so. Uh, Maybe the white region includes the point delta. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Prima, when you say this answer is wrong, is that just phenomenology? Yeah, this angle is, <laughs> is, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's really phenomenology, because suppose this was true, then I make a prediction, which is a sufficiently big black hole, a sufficiently small black hole is going to explode uh, in a second. Right. And we do see black holes. But let's suppose I, I take that. This is the last so, transparency. Real quickly, you said you were calculating the transition amplitude, right? Yeah. But how did you get the time out of the amplitude? Ah, <laughs> Because, uh, it's, it's, it's extremely beautiful, because the time here is related to how <coughs> distant this point is from 2m. That's actually what the other is. You can view this way. There's another way of viewing the geometry outside. Take a, uh, take a ball uh, with a certain radius a, zero mass, eh, uh, with a mirror 
outside and have a shell of light coming in, bouncing and bouncing out. Okay? Now I sit at a certain distance of it, and I want to know how long for me, in my time, I'm a fixed radius, it takes the, 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 the light to bounce on the mirror and come back to me. <coughs> of course, when uh, the radius of the mirror gets close to 2m, 2m being the mass of the light, this, this becomes arbitrarily long. Okay? And this gives a logarithm. So you can view this in a sort of fake, ge fake geometry, uh, delta being the difference between 2m uh, and uh, the mirror uh, radius. Mm -hmm. So when, uh, when the mirror radius is 2m plus delta, the time outside is logarithmic. This is very small, and this is logarithmic in there. So once you understand that, you understand that in order to study this time here, you just need to know this delta. Okay. So you have a complete, it's, 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 it's entirely determined by the... So how does the amplitude get delta? Because delta in terms determines the curvature of the surface here. You just, is this a tunneling calculation, or is this classical evolution, Hamiltonian evolution? It's a statement that Hamiltonian evolution involves this ingoing shell to the outgoing shell. Okay. It's a calculation of two steps. It's a calculation of two steps. There's a classical metric in which you have a relation to some quantities. So, and answer the, the question by Ted was what is the relation between this time outside and the geometry around here? That was one question. Okay. And once you have the geometry around here, the calculation is um, given a surface with a certain geometry here. And given a surface with a certain geometry here, okay, I want to have a quantum gravity calculation which associates to two geometries, intrinsic and extrinsic geometry, an amplitude of going from one to the other. The, the, the claim of the story, that's, a, that's a, the, the, message, the tentative message of the, of the talk, is that this is a, you're in a finite region of space time, you know something about before and up, and you, you can compute transition amplitude. This transition amplitude in that particular case ha happened to depend on two parameters. So the way I'm using it is that when the, oops, when the probability is 1, I get a relation to the other. Say that amplitude is small, that would tell me that this ingoing shell would probably transition to some other state that's not this nice outgoing shell. That's one way of viewing it. In fact, if I could do the full story here, I would be in a, in a, in a, in a logic similar to Jim in which you can go out to different geometries that's possible. That right. And is there some reason to think that this particular outgoing geometry would be would, would dominate or would have any appreciable support in the way Um well uh, I mean clearly in some in, in, in some form of gravity there, there's gonna be some transition amplitude that's not gonna be zero. The issue is all the other things that you could transition to. Well, yeah. Let me no. This is a this is a this is an your question is perfectly legitimate. This is in a in a much smaller context. I have a when you do tunneling, standard tunneling, you say I can have the the, 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 the wave packet inside, the wave packet outside, or compute the probability for going from this classical solution to that classical solution. Construct something, you make a calculation, say the probability is large or small, depending on the time. I'm just doing this. So there is a classical solution outside, which I know, which depends on the parameter, time, bouncing time, and I want to do a calculation of transition from that to that, and saying, is there a, a value of the parameter that makes the transition likely in quantum gravity? I'm not claiming that I have the general calculation of all possible. Is there any what, what you have in the quantum mechanics case that you're missing here is, is you know what the possible final states are. You know all the possible Yeah, states. yeah. I, I, I don't have it. You also know right. that the probability is always sum up to one. I don't know. I don't even know how to phrase here. Yeah. That's right. So let me just have the, the last two slides just to conclude. Sorry, to, maybe I could. We should, yeah, we should. Maybe I could put is a, have two slides, one one summer slide and one final slide, and then I think the zillions of things. So, the, but but I care about this slide here because uh, suppose this was true and suppose m square was a right solution or m cube was a right solution, 
Uh, then there is a very vague chance, but I want to talk about that, even with all the possible caveats that you can imagine, that this phenomenon will be uh, observable. Why? Because uh, um, um, if there are primordial black holes, then perhaps some of these primordial black holes may be exploding today. If you have a mass to time, if you know what the relation mass time, from the Hubble time, you look at the mass. So you can say what is the mass of exploding black holes today. Now, if uh, T is n cube, um, what you get is uh, uh, signals the cosmic ray spectrum. So very, very weak suggestion, could some of, you know, you know, get cosmic rays for all sorts of, uh, could some of this be in fact from what the black hole exploding? But even more interesting, if T is m square, m square, which is my by far preferred uh, scenario, uh, it's a simple calculation. The exploding black hole today is in the centimeters. You wouldn't believe it, but if you take Planck numbers and Hubble time, you get centimeters. Uh, centimeters means in the radio. And there happen to be uh, signals called the fast radio burst, that's one, which are very strong impulsive signals in the radio, in the in 20 centimeters, in fact, not centimeters, uh, which the, the astronomers are, are, are very puzzled. They are extragalactic, their sources are known. So, of course, this is a wide speculation, it's throwing in the dark, but could some of this be, in fact, exploding? Does the energy match? You've also got, you know, you're... Is you've a got huge a energy coming out, yes, yes. But you have, a, you just no, wrote down an energy 10 to the 38 or that they it's have... It's smaller, it's smaller than the, than the energy of the black hole. By what factors? Uh, One is a uh, 47, another is uh, energy, and The black hole is 10 to the 47 er in oh, yeah. mass, and you get it, and they see 10 to the so factor okay. of the the centimeter is this internal time? Centimeters is a, is a, this is a, uh, Did you explain the internal wave, times are redshift? The wavelength, uh, roughly the wavelength is the size of the explosion. Yeah. This internal time? No, just the short size. Just the short Just the short Would the energy have to know if it's beams, right? Sorry? <coughs> the energy estimates, you have to know if it's beamed in some direction. Do you, do you know that? I know nothing about the astrophysics of that. First, because I'm ignorant, and second, because it's so crude, this model here. I mean, this is a, remember, it's, it's, a, it's a null shell collapsing and bouncing. Whatever happens in reality is not a null shell, it's a rotating, it's, a, it's, it's a time like and not light like. Okay, so I just want to conclude. The main message is that I think uh, <coughs> you. There is a sense of being local, which is just forget infinity, forget the whole of space time, you're here, you know some knowledge of what happens here, some knowledge of what happens here, you have a quantum gravitational calculation. You have a bulk boundary structure, but you can have a bulk boundary structure which is entirely determined by the data on the boundary. And that's what I suggest uh, could be a way of addressing local, in this particular sense, local can mean all sorts of things. Uh, uh, the, the, the transition, these transition amplitudes are fully gauge invariant. There's nothing wrong in all this gauge invariants. Ignore infinity and don't need other complications. Of course, they have their own complications. So, let me start. <laughs>
it's dominating with respect to local radiation. Remember that local radiation, m cube is meant, right? Because m here is m over m, over, m, over m plug. So for a stellar mass, uh, time m cube is a time m times a dimensional factor, which is the mass of the star in, over micrograms, which is immense. So the Hawking radiation is a very, very, very weak phenomenon. And I'm suggesting that uh, when, when you work with Hawking radiation, you're disregarding quantum gravity, of course. I'm suggesting that in quantum gravity, there might be phenomena which are come before you. So would you predict, right, for example, black holes formed in the early universe would have no effect on the diffuse X-ray background? Would you, would you uh, then predict from this that black holes formed in the early universe, whatever they were, these would have no effect on the diffuse X-ray background, which was the original place people looked for black hole radiation, like a kink. I don't know. I don't know. Of course, yeah. Now one interesting question is now to redo all the old calculation that has been done for primordial black holes, but now instead of considering a radiation coming from uh, Hawking radiation, this considering this uh, new radiation coming from the explosion. Yeah, so. I was just asking uh, uh, yeah, ahead of the calculations, I guess. Okay, one more question, then we should continue the rest informally. So, uh, many takers. Uh, what about someone who hasn't asked a question? Andrea. Yeah, uh, I was just wondering, if you allow a little bit of talking radiation, then you immediately use, lose unitarity, right? I mean, just by a little bit, maybe. Because your uh, quantum corrective region is inside the horizon, so there is, if it Hawking evaporates a little bit, it doesn't take away uh, information from the infalling shell, and so the outgoing shell after the bounce. Yes and no. And in fact, I'm fighting with my younger philosophy. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, the if you if you allow Hawking radiation, Hawking radiation goes out here, of course, right? Uh, but uh, the, the standard story is a little bit uh, changed because uh, there is, a, I mean, there is no one way of viewing the lack of unitarity is just the fact that you go from sky glass, the thing is unitary as a map from sky minus to sky glass times to light. It's mostly light here. So here, everything that can comes in can go out. Now, of course, my be that there's still lack of unitarity because I'm disregarding the, the, the entanglement with geometry itself. It might happen there, it might be, uh, I'm not claiming that I know that happens in unitarity of radiation. Um, what some people did is to compute Hawking radiation in a two-dimensional approximation on this geometry. And what they claim is that the back reaction is large, but I don't sure. So they claim that um, you can, right? you can redo the standard calculation on this geometry here instead of the standard uh, uh, one in which you just cut at, uh, at, uh, at uh, here. Okay, well, maybe we can discuss the more of that informally. I guess you'll be here for a few more days. I'll be here for the week. Yeah, okay, so there can be, uh, certainly should be more discussion with Carl, but thanks again.